Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're really excited to have you with us uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, so feel free to say in the chat, um, you know, introduce yourself, where you're from, um, and, and meet other guests. Um, before we do get started with the webinar today, I do have a couple housekeeping uh, items. Uh, so the first one being that you can really use the chat at any time uh, to make a comment, uh, to ask questions. Uh, we also have a Q&A section uh, during the webinar. So it's the tab on, on the right hand corner with the question mark. Uh, that's where you can ask your questions and we'll be sifting uh, through those at the very end of the webinar today. And then finally, uh, the webinar itself is being recorded. Uh, so that will be sent out to you in about two to three business days. So just keep that in mind that you can go back and rewatch uh, re the session today. So with that, uh, I'll pass it to you, Trevaney. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I am Trevaney Gandhi. I am the responsible AI lead at DataIQ. And I'm very excited today to talk to you about how we're actually going to start moving towards the implementation of responsible governed AI practices, especially given that uh, regulation is coming. So with that in mind, I'm going to I'm going to kick off here uh, and we are going to start by just as a refresher in previous webinars in this series. You've heard from uh, my colleague Jacob about how some of the AI acts key interventions, which are, you know, a new risk ta taxonomy, maybe new requirements associated with those risk tiers, um, new obligations for general purpose AI models, both providers and users, and of course, uh, the penalties for non-compliance. So I'm not going to rehash that. That is something we've already covered in previous ones, but just as a reminder that there are some real stakes here. And in many sort of respects, right, and at a very high level, it would seem like there's a lot of certainty, right? Rules are rules. We know that there are risk tiers. We know how to associate AI systems with that. And we have a pretty good understanding of the new requirements. But also as previous webinars have identified, we're still waiting on a lot of clarification for how we're supposed to exactly meet those requirements and what does meeting those requirements mean. And along with this, Organizations today are considering distribution of those responsibilities and the use of different technologies to support with future compliance. So there's a real risk then that if we can't answer those questions, uh, we might enter an age of AI slowdown, right? Which is to say, well, there's a lot of risk tiers, there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of reg regulations. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I don't know how we're supposed to be compliant. And so because of that, we're just going to put a pause or a slowdown on um, you know, cr critical AI use cases. Now, what our goal here today is to show you is that that's not uh, entirely the path that you need to go down, right? With a good governance platform, with the right kind of approach um, in mind, you can start to be, be ready for regulation, right? Not necessarily, uh, you know, be perfectly compliant because no one knows what that means yet, uh, but at least be closer to readiness, uh, be aligned with the kinds of thinking that is um, common across the EU AI Act and, and other sort of frameworks. So today what we're going to look at uh, are a number of data IQ governance capabilities. And um, in the spirit of sort of readiness and in an effort not to overlap with the final webinar, which will be a deep dive into our EU AI Act solution, I want to highlight some key capabilities today. So one, we'll see the ability to create tailored workflows. We'll see uh, more information around AI system qualification, which is specifically a look at pre-assessments. We'll talk about how, it's, how we're able to document sign-offs and traceability, um, as well as a centralized registry for all of our models and bundles, and importantly, LLM governance or Gen AI governance, uh, which is becoming more and more relevant as folks are coming online with the LLM mesh and being able to uh, integrate generative AI into a new number of use cases. And all of this is made possible because of the way that the data IQ govern 
uh, node has been set up as a centralized analytics and AI control tower. So I'm gonna switch over now to the demo. Um, and what we'll do is start here, right? So if you know Dataiku, uh, you know, at all, you know that the design node is where most of the magic happens. But from the design node, I can access my govern node. And inside of the govern node, we'll see that we've got sort of five key areas that we can look into. We can see what needs to be governed, projects and models. We can see the registry of those models and those bundles that we have already governed. We can also look at our business initiatives, right, which is sort of a linking of projects across key in, key initiatives, key uh, project goals, et cetera. And then, of course, the governed projects themselves. What are the status? What's the status of those projects? How are they doing? So let's start with our governed projects. We can see here that we've got a number of projects in flight. They are tied to different kinds of business initiatives. Some of these are marketing. Some of them are finance. Some of them are part of the manufacturing control. And we can also see a high level sort of breakdown of um, where do these projects sit within our risk value matrix, right? So um, being able to quickly sort of assess what are my high risk and high value or high risk but low value kinds of projects and are we allocating those resources accordingly, right? Maybe we don't wanna do the high risk, low value projects, but definitely wanna put more energy into the low risk, high value ones. So with that in mind, okay, we've got, we've got all of our projects. We can see that there's a number of projects in flight. They're in various stages of their governance. Um, but let's take a step back and think about what this might look like if we were starting from scratch, right? We were starting a brand new project. Well, before we even begin the project, we want to qualify that. We want to know that we have actually gone ahead and done the pre-build uh, pre assessments that are required um, for our own internal, let's say, purposes, right? So I'm going to start here my pre-assessments page, and you'll see that I've got a very simple sort of pre-assessment built out. This is an example, right? This workflow can be as complex or as minimal as you need for your, your use cases. Uh, typically, we see customers um, with larger, more complex workflows for very high risk use cases, right? Things that directly affect someone's ability to get access to a good. Um, and, you know, less, less complicated workflows when the overall risk is lower. In this case, we can see we've gotten some of the core details listed here. Um, you know, what is the actual project about? Who's the sponsor? Who's the developer? Right? What are the kind of core considerations we might have around this? As well as what are our expectations for reporting and transparency? Now you'll see here that we've gone ahead and filled out that information. And as we get to the end here, we can actually ask for final approval. And this is the sort of first sign off in our process of of uh, governing AI. Here, we're gonna delegate that approval. And when I, I delegate it to myself uh, and, re and request it, I can come in, I can review it and hit, you know, approved or, or declined. And when I do that, on the back end, DataIQ will be able to make the actual project. So, you know, project instances being our big folders here will actually make the project with a sort of tag of pre-build past or pre-assessment complete. So that way we're only starting new projects um, meant for production after they've been approved in the pre-assessment stage. So we're not um, you know, letting sandbox, sandbox kind of projects get into production environments, but we can sort of start regulating and governing that AI from the very beginning. So I say review, this looks good, um, you know, okay by me, great. And now, I, I don't know if you caught it very quickly, there was a little spinning circle and that spinning circle is the actual process, the hook is running to go ahead and build out the project on the design side for us. So we've got our project started, we've started building it. Um, you know, there are a number of features within core DataIQ design oriented around the responsible use of, of um, AI and the way that we build our models. 
Uh, we can talk about these more in Q and A if there if there are questions. But suffice to say that we've got our project started. We started building it out. So now that I know that my project is in flight, I need to actually check in on it as it's as it's being developed and get information and feedback. So I'm going to go into my govern projects. We'll see here that my loan default project again, pretty simple workflow just for the purposes of illustration. When you see the uh, final EU AI Act solution, you will understand just how complex these workflows can get. But for now, we can see that we've got this linked to different business initiatives. Um, we can link back to our pre assessment that we've already filled out and we can start tracking and monitoring critical uh, aspects of our um, of our project. So, for example, here I've got these data data sets that are my core input data sets and I can track information about them. Like, does this have PII? What is our retention policy? I can link to my dashboards and upload flow documentation with my models. Right. I can say that, look, we're going to have these three metrics as the core metrics. These are the minimum and maximum values that are allowed for those those metrics before the model can go to production. So if we have an accuracy of one, we probably need to uh, look at that model again. Frankly, even 0.99 might be a little too high for uh, accuracy of a, of a good model, but we have like a baseline of, you know, we wanna make sure precision and recall are at least at a certain level. We can also list out what are our bias thresholds? You know, are we looking at certain kinds of disparity between subgroups? Uh, do we have certain fairness metrics we care about? And what are those thresholds that are specific for this use case that we want to be able to look at? Um, now, when it comes to deployment, we're going to take a look at the, the bundles themselves as well as the models. So we'll start with the models. Um, we can see in here, I've got my, my model you know, diamond, but within that, I've got uh, different kinds of versions. And so I'll come into my XGBoost model, I can see, again, those uh, core metrics here based on that model. And here I can say, how's the accuracy? Well, we said that it had to be point, uh, point 0.8 minimum, and it passed that check. So that's pretty good for us. Um, the recall, we had said, needs to be um, higher than that. And in fact, it's not. So we're going to say error, right? This is not actually good. Um, and that's something for us to keep in mind. Uh, we can, you know, then of course continue down, add in that information, go ahead and request that feedback from the different stakeholders in this case, um, and be able to then uh, approve that for deployment or pre-deployment testing. Now, this model isn't a live endpoint; it's a batch model. So, even though we're going to approve this model for deployment, it won't actually go into deployment until we approve the bundle that it is a part of. So if we go back here to our deployment stage, now I'm going to my bundle, which is to say, this is what I want to actually deploy. And again, you know, do we have a deployment plan? What is the model that we're actually attaching with this? Um, did we do these required QA checks? What was the date? What is the report? And is the bundle ready to deploy to QA? Now, this is an interesting kind of example that I wanted to highlight. We actually have clients that are using um, this kind of workflow or this sort of toggle on, toggle off to actually deploy the bundle for you. So that way, someone who is involved in the process, right, who needs to be the one who says sign off to send this to QA, we want to try it out, uh, can actually be the trigger for a deployment. And you don't need to have a bottleneck from your MLOps team or your IT team that you're waiting on to deploy, um, in this case, for that QA deployment. Then we've got the user user checks and um, you know results, which I forgot to put the date in of that. So we'll say that that was today. Uh, and we've got those checks done. And now we're going to then ask for those reviews, um, make sure that the production checklist has been met, that is production ready. And when we get that final approval, we could set this up so that it automatically deploys to production once the business user has signed off. So this is a, a, a way for you to create that traceability to say that this person was the owner, they were the final sort of the final approver in this situation, they approved it and only then did it go to production. 
Now, all of this is uh, our, our approach or an example of how you might approach governing traditional ML models. Um, I already see there's a question in the chat around generative AI models, um, specifically for RAG. And I will, I will actually um, answer that question after the demo here is done. But before we, uh, you know, before we get to that part of the, of the conversation, I want to talk to you about how we might actually think about governing generative AI. Now, we know that within the ecosystem of generative AI, we don't have control over the models that are coming from third parties, right? We don't actually know how these models were trained, what their data set, what data sets were used, what parameters were made. But what we can do is centralize visibility into those models, into those connections, and also centralize our approach to governing the use cases themselves. So in this case, you'll see that I've got a registry here, and these are all of the connections that we have enabled on our design side using the LLM mesh, which is our sort of entry point API gateway into all the different kinds of models that are out there. And in this case, I've created an open AI connection. Um, we have some basic questions. Well, what's the intended usage? Do we have sort of vendor details? Is there a contract? Are there sort of contractual terms we need to be mindful of? What projects are using this connection? Which I will um, click into that next. And then we can ask for certain readiness checks. So what models are we allowing on this connection? Who's allowed to access it? Are we going to query it? You know, query, uh, uh, audit the query data. And where are we saving that audit data? Um, are there any forbidden terms that we're going to prevent in the prompts themselves? And are we going to do toxicity detection on the prompts and outputs or PAI detection? Um, as well as sort of other checks for, okay, who's owning this connection? Have we done the correct API tests and um, gateway checks that we needed? After that's done, we can ask for final approval. And after the approval is done, the connection can be built on the data IQ LLM side. So in this way, we're not just, you know, spinning up connections to LLMs left and right, but we're really being mindful and thoughtful about how do we want to uh, actually build this connection? What are the key parameters? Who's allowed to use it? And we might have different parameters for different kinds of users and different kinds of use, case, use cases, right? This is a very um, restricted use, usage because it's meant for production usage of data IQ answers. But let's say we have data scientists who want to experiment with the latest hugging face model or the latest um, llama version. Well, we can create a open-ended, a more open-ended connection, but still have those parameters listed here of who's going to be allowed to use this um, and, and make sure that it's still secured in that way. Now, remember I said that we can't actually govern the models themselves that are being uh, provided by a third party. But what we can do is at least uh, consolidate those model cards into a single place so that at least we know, okay, we've got a GPT-35 model we're using. Um, what, is the, what is the description coming directly from the model provider, in this case, OpenAI? And we can actually um, also list out what are the approved uses here. So direct use for RAG on internal business documentation and out of scope are anything using protected data and sensitive information. So this is this is important for us to be able to, to note that. Now, when I go back to my connection here, I can actually see, all right, I've got a, a project here that's using this connection. And again, we've built out a custom sort of workflow um, asking us about what is this actual project? What are we actually trying to do? Um, are there certain decommission thre thresholds? Checking for that allowable usage. And then of course, um, project qualification, uh, data validation that are we using the right data set for the actual RAG that we're building out on the, on the back end? Do we have any um, performance tests that we're doing? Are there non-Gen AI models as a part of this project that need to be governed, right? In this case, this ridge regression, as well as then, you know, questions around UX design and then final sort of approval based on these pre-deployment checks. Again, this is sort of an example of how we might think about governing um, governing the, the LLM workflow, but with 
with an eye towards uh, sort of traceability. Now, the last thing I want to show um, as, a, as a functionality of, of Dataiku is the ability to govern uh, models that are not built in Dataiku. We understand that there will always be users who are uh, have a preference, let's say, for Databricks, um, and they want to build and deploy their models using the Unity catalog. Well, how can you uh, extend governance over those kinds of models um, from the same sort of central watchtower in a way that the the owners of the governance process can actually reasonably interact with those models. So with that in mind, we have these external models um, kind of uh, option. And here you'll see that we've got a Databricks model. It's called credit, it's broadly about credit repayments. And it you know can be aligned to a business initiative just like our other projects. But we have some different kind of information listed here. So what's the model name? What's the created date? You know, what catalog, what schema is it in on the Unity catalog side? And we can choose to actually say, are we going to qualify this project or this model? And should it actually move to our pre-production environment for review? Uh, now, again, similar to what we saw on the other workflows, when I approve this um, move to pre-prod, on the back end, Dataiku is actually able to move the model in the Unity catalog um, based on uh, whatever parameters you have set up there and move it to where it needs to go. Similarly, when we look at our uh, model version for this model, we can see that there are um, a version alias that has been assigned here. And so that assign assignment of the alias, I'm going to change now to challenger. And when I request that final approval and sign off, it will actually change that alias for me on the Databricks Unity catalog without me needing to go into the Databricks ecosystem. And so this becomes a way for you to have a unified governance program across all of your different models, uh, even if they're not in Dataiku. And I think I, I see this question in the chat. Um, all of this is fully customizable, right? More checkboxes, um, more kinds of uh, metrics, different kinds of workflow steps, different kinds of links, fully customizable. Um, we want you to bring your governance framework and make the tool work work for it, right? We don't want our tool to tell you what your governance framework should be. That said, if you are interested in sort of a basic kind of workflow, we do offer a standard workflow right here, which has five steps. Um, the bundle itself also only has a few steps for review. But uh, what we're seeing more and more is that Clients are coming to us with very precise workflows, very precise expectations of how they'd like to monitor their, their AI systems. And as a result, they're building very robust and very um, customized kinds of templates, right? Both from a workflow standpoint and what kind of information, checkboxes versus text fields, et cetera. So that covers the main, um, uh, I guess, demo portion of this. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over, I think, um, before we switch over to the Q&A section, um, I just want to call out that um, we do have a couple of things coming up next. So first is that we will be presenting our final EU AI solution um, coming up shortly this fall. So things to ask yourself right before that. Do I know how my AI systems are operationalized across organization? Am I confident about those risk levels? Um, is there a team that is getting ready for EU AI Act uh, readiness? And on our side, we'll be uh, presenting a lot of great information during our product days that are coming up on both October 8th and October 9th. Um, my colleagues will be talking about how we build a system of trust, um, how to debunk some of these myths around the EU AI Act, and really how do we take theory to practice and build that sort of responsible AI approach. Um, so with that said, I'm going to stop sharing here and we can come back and start discussing some of these questions I see both in the Q&A and in the, the chat. Okay, great. So let's start from the, the beginning. So uh, Sebastian asks, is risk analysis mandatory in the cases of generative AI based applications using RAG processes? 
Who is responsible for risk analysis in this case? Um, well, so I guess the question is mandatory according to who? Um, I think that in the EU AI Act, there are definitely indicators that if you are going to be using a generative AI model for even a RAG purpose, you do need to have some sort of qualification there. Um, and who's responsible for the risk analysis in this case? This is very dependent on your organization. Who do you think needs to own that final sign off on risk analysis? You know, I have clients that are doing this more from the risk and compliance side. So the legal team plus compliance are working together to define what are those risk parameters um, and then ask the business, ask the data science teams to be aligned with those risk parameters. There are also a number of um, risk sort of frameworks, or I guess what's the, the word I'm looking for, um, like risk indicators, risk, risk sort of modalities that have been released by, let's say NIST, which is the National Institute for Science and Technology. Um, I know that MIT recently put out a big taxonomy of risk um, as well, AI related risks. And so those are places that your team can draw on to say, well, these are the risks that we think are most important. But chances are that if you're in a regulated industry already, you do have a risk and compliance team. And chances are that even if you're not, you have a legal team and that legal team will be mindful of certain kinds of legal risks at the very least, which is a good starting point. Great, okay, so we have another question here um, by Eduardo. So what is the, the federal AI governance to control and manage as per comparative prompt engineering and outcome development, different skills, and stakeholders as per ALAAS. Okay, or AIAAS. Oh, okay, I see. Um, so part of of our uh, core data IQ platform includes a prompt studio that allows you to actually um, test and uh, check prompts before they become used in a production production environment. So you'd be able to first test the prompt. Does it actually return the results we want? as well as what's the overall cost of such a prompt. Um, and that is how you actually build in some of those controls and management pieces at the design side. Um, from the govern side, you know, you could be listing out those requirements, listing out those expectations as uh, guidance for the data scientist who's building it. And part of your certification or your validation process could be, did you check this prompt in Prompt Studio? make sure that the maximum cost is not exceeding, you know, five cents per token, whatever it might be, and being able to then, again, communicate those pieces of information back and forth. Um, so, so another question here from Sebastian, does uh, Data IQ govern distinguish between usage of LLM provided by third party providers um, and LLM, which are deployed in a specific cloud space, such as Azure, uh, of a company. Uh, yes, of course. The LLM mesh itself can distinguish from that and Govern itself will also be able to do that, right? Because as long as we've built out that connection that is linked to whether it's the third party or our privately hosted kind of LLM, we can uh, create that associated tag, so to speak, or associated connection there to say, this is our privately hosted one. These are the requirements that we're going to have for it. And in fact, in a privately hosted LLM, um, maybe if you're doing fine tuning or you're doing some sort of, maybe you're building your own from scratch, that gives you the opportunity to actually govern it in an even more controlled environment and really lay out what are the requirements for this model's success? What are the requirements for the data that we're going to put into it, et cetera. Okay, great. And then a um, question here from Eduardo. So how do we manage vertical or horizontal AI learning to manage topics? Uh, let's see, I manage topics such as ethics, societal bias, concerns, compliance, et cetera. Yeah, so the thing about AI governance, right, is that I hear people say this all the time. Oh, AI governance is gonna come in, it's just compliance, it's gonna get in the way, it's gonna slow things down. And what people don't realize is that governance and responsible AI is not about uh, stopping innovation and it's not about a checklist, it's about a new way of thinking. And so really what you're asking here, Eduardo, Eduardo, is like, how do we actually create some kind of change management? Um, and really it, it's, 
it's a more holistic approach than just saying, here's a tool, right? The tool is very important. The tool is how we execute on that change. But within organizations, there has to be a sense of um, ownership and responsibility for all users, right? And so whether that means education, you know, AI literacy practices, which Dataiq offers, or training on how to use um, Dataiq responsibly, which is something we also offer, uh, it, it really just depends on what your goals are in terms of enablement and change across the organization. And what we really like to see is when clients say, okay, we, we know we're going to implement this tool. We know we're going to implement a governance process, but we want everyone involved in it. It's not just a top down. It is every business owner has a stake here um, in the governance process. Every data scientist has expectations and they themselves are like, bought in on those expectations because we've enabled them we've explained to them the real risks and harms of poorly designed models and sometimes it's just as simple as explaining to folks that hey it's not even about bias it's not even about social stuff it's about making sure that the models themselves do what we want them to do right reliability which is a core core premise of any ai governance system it's not just about stopping you from doing something it's about saying if we're going to do it, let's do it absolutely right. And I think that's something that any organization can get behind, which is we want to make sure whatever we're doing adds value because we've done it the right way. Now, I see that in the um, uh, another question here from Esteban. Um, in the risk value matrix, we distinguish between different risk levels. How would these be defined for a customizable GPT from a vendor or third party? That's a great question. Um, it's fully customizable to however you wish. Um, the risk value matrix that we have there is a sort of standard kind of high, medium high, medium low, low um, breakdown. But we do um, ask, uh, we do we do allow the the users to define different kinds of risk profiles. And in fact, I've seen uh, a few customers do on the fly calculations for risk. So they might have a sort of mapping that if you answer yes to question A and no to question B, your value for risk is 0.5. But if you do yes to both questions, the risk jumps to 1.5. So those kinds of on the fly calculations can also be done within the tool and then mapped onto the, the matrix there. Uh, question here from Margarita, is the AI governance platform proactively updated according to both NIST and AI EU AI Act regulations? Yes. Of course, so we are keeping on top of the policies that are coming out, um, any of the requirements, and we will be keeping up with the different kinds of, uh, you know, things happening in, in the market, in the field, to make sure that you guys can also stay up to date. Um, and, you know, we do have a number of sort of things in flight, including um, a very detailed NIST situation, uh, solution, an ISO 420, a one solution um, and, and other kinds of regulations that will be coming up uh, down the line on our roadmap. George asks, uh, who are the users of this tool? C-level leaders, legal, compliance, infosec, AI developers, prod deployments, all of the above and more or, or not, right? This is very much open to what you think the processes should be. Now I will say this though, um, I have a couple of customers where the data scientists are heavily involved with the tool because they are actually the ones who are owning, okay, I did the checks, I did the requirements, I'm ready for this to go into prod because it's sort of a agreement between data scientists and ML ops teams to say, did you do what was required in order for us to feel comfortable with deploying this? So there are some use cases there and those typically are the less risky use cases, right? These are things where we don't need to worry too much about legal compliance coming in. But um, we also have a lot of users who come in from that uh, legal compliance side who are saying, OK, these are the requirements that are outlined in some sort of policy or some sort of document. How are we translating this into like actual uh, questions, actual checks that we care about? And they are, in fact, more of the builder type, right? They're actually building out those templates that then different business users, different kinds of um, profiles, maybe it's the business unit, maybe it's the data science manager are working on. Um, and so who your approvers are will again, depend on that process. But we do see a number of, um, we see, we see a mix of, you know, like 
risk legal compliance. We see IT or ML ops, as well as um, the as well as the uh, sort of data scientist when appropriate. Now, the other thing I will say is that C-level leaders can actually highly benefit from this tool. One thing I didn't show was sort of um, a broad overview dashboard, right? Which is which is also something we have um, near completion. And so I didn't wanna show it yet because we'll be presenting that in a, a more splashy way. But essentially what we want is for this to be an AI sort of risk compliance monitoring center. So that maybe, maybe it's not a C-level, but it's like a VP reporting to a C-level who comes in and says, okay, what are all the projects we've got going on? What are their average risks? You know, how many of them are on track? How many of them have come off track? Are we actually um, making sure that these projects are progressing well in flight? And so really the Govern node can do kind of uh, a gamut of, of um, users, right? From the very detailed, I need to get in and specifically add in information about my project that I want to go to production, to a higher level data science manager saying, what are, what's the status of all my projects under my purview to then that C-level or VP level who's saying, how are our business initiatives progressing? Are they on track? Are they at risk? What's going on here? And so we want to be able to give you that gradient across. Okay, and another question here from Sebastian. In the case of change specific parameters of an LLM, such as temperature or environment, number of vectors, is there a need to update risk analysis once more according to the EU AI Act? Um, this is a great question. I can't actually give you a, a straight answer on this. I will have to defer to my colleague, Jacob, who is our like EU AI Act expert. Um, he has read the whole thing, I think like three times, which is crazy to me. Um, so we will have to follow up with you on that answer. But uh, I think that honestly, I think it's still a little bit unclear um, from, from the, from the legislation, but uh, we can certainly follow up with you on that kind of risk analysis. Uh, there is uh, actually another question I've seen, um, which is that, you know, how do we take those uh, external models, things that are like in Databricks or SageMaker, how do we govern those? You know, what is the, the process there? And the answer really is, again, if you have a governance process outlined that all of our models need to go through X, Y, Z steps, uh, well, then apply those same steps to those models and you can actually use the existing workflow or the, the type of workflow you care about. Maybe it is an EU AI Act workflow, but you can point it and have that control over that uh, third party model, right? That, that SageMaker model, that Databricks model, whatever is required. So that customization and the ability to fully customize these um, workflows is a really key component of this, of this tool. Okay, and then um, another question, is it possible to document parameter setting in DataIQ Govern? I'm not sure, oh, I see, are you documenting the parameters for an LLM? Yes, absolutely, right? So, um, the idea here is that you want to be able to pull in that kind of information around what are we doing around those parameters that is fully customizable and fully, um, fully, you know, shareable across. Our goal is to be tightly integrated between design and govern. Another question here, what is our key difference from other AI governance platforms? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't like to do sort of like that competitive thing. I think that people should use the tool that's right for them. Um, I believe that this tool is the right tool for organizations because it is the only tool that's giving you an end-to-end -end view of the AI governance lifecycle. So because of the way DataIQ is built, both as a place to design and experiment with your AI systems, a place to deploy, monitor, have overview, oversight, and a place to govern, we're the only tool on the market that can let you do all of that end to end in a shared collaborative environment, right? So that way your data scientists are not out in three different data science platforms that you're trying to govern over. Your IT team is not using 
four different kinds of deployment infrastructures that again also need to be governed, but rather everyone's in the same place. And actually even being in the same place, they can still use those tools they prefer, right? Coders inside of Dataiku can still use Code Studios, right? Their preferred Code Studio. Um, you know, IT teams can still integrate with other kinds of DevOps and MLN sort of um, um, IT ops kinds of platforms while still being able to centralize it within a single sort of orchestration place. So Dataiku is that orchestration layer on top of all of your different data, on top of all your different types of operations, but in a way that it's also collaborative and letting everyone come to that, that place, sort of leveling the playing field. Great. Um, so we see customers uh, uh, implementing various practices. It's crucial that our data remains completely private and not accessible to anyone outside of our approved team, including the data IQ general team. I would like to know how our data and models are protected when using your platform. That's a great question, right? The first thing to note is that there is like, while well, we have a SaaS sort of cloud offer for data IQ, um, a majority of our enterprise customers are using their own cloud on-prem solution. And because of that, we have no access into anything that they're doing, right? And actually even our cloud users, we don't have access into that unless they give us the permission to do so. So the first thing is that DataIQ does not wanna see your data, does not wanna see your models. We want you to have the ability to do what you need to do um, in a secure and protected environment. So your data remains where it should be, right? In its own secure, tables and databases that you've set up. Um, DataIQ is connecting to that, but we as a company cannot access that, right? We cannot access your models. And in fact, within the tool, you can also set really fine grained control around who can see your, your models and data within the company, right? So you can say that this user group is not allowed to use the production tables. This user group is not allowed to see any of the projects related to HR initiatives, let's say. And so you can actually create that control and um, those those barriers where you need to create the barriers and collaboration where you need to create collaboration. Because we understand that you're not going to collaborate on everything, but on the things that you need to, it's easy to do. And on the things that need to be separated, they can easily stay separated. Okay, I hope that these have been helpful. I know there were one or two questions there where I said, look, I don't know because the EU AI Act hasn't told us yet either, um, but uh, hopefully this has been uh, an exciting and informative session for everyone. Um, so like I said, please, please stay tuned for our upcoming product days, as well as our final sort of webinar in this series around the EU AI Act um, and what we're going to be presenting as our sort of solution based on the newest version of the, of the act.